record. You are now all officially being recorded. Um, uh, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. It's really great to see everyone here. The handout is in the Zoom chat. Uh, you're welcome to download that or uh, and look at it. Um, I invite you to keep your camera on because I like to see your faces and it's nice to see you. This is the closest we can uh, be in, in, at this time. Um, I, I, there are so many feelings that I had in preparing this class. It's an unusual uh, reality um, beyond just obviously looking at the material. Uh, so many different emotions that pour through as we look at this. Uh, and they really are somewhat contradictory. On the one hand, there's an incredible amount of hakarata tov, of gratitude to the Almighty, that we live in a time where we have the capability and the ability to create this vaccine it's a remarkable achievement of humanity. We have not just cut the time in half, but in a quarter for the fastest vaccine ever produced. And it, it, it's no less than a miracle. And it's unbelievable the people who are working at Pfizer and Moderna and the national, international effort that has come together in funds and resources and uh, research to make this happen. And that, that's unbelievable to watch as uh, we watch history unfold. At the same time, you know, we talk about this with a, with a bit of a heavy heart and, and incredible sensitivity. There are at this moment over 125,000 people in our country who are in the hospital who are not gonna be helped by a vaccine. Over 350,000 Americans have lost their lives to this pandemic and so many more worldwide. So many families and friends have been impacted by this. And it, it, as, as Jews, as humans, we have a responsibility to share in that sar, in that pain, in that suffering. And, it, and it's important to note, and, it, and unfortunately people are reluctant to acknowledge just the scope of the catastrophe. Every day, more Americans die than in Pearl Harbor or 9-11. In Israel, in America, more people have died in Israel cumulatively for COVID than in any terror attack or in any war. And so we balance some of these emotions together as we, as we look at this. And it's important for us to, to recognize that as we move forward as Jews and as, as human beings, that that needs to inform our conversation. So what's our plan? So we threw out a little bit of some of the questions that circle around people's heads when we talk about this. My hope tonight is to deal more broadly with the question of should we get the vaccine or not and what that means and how do we assess that information as Jews, as re religiously sensitive individuals who live our lives predicated on the norms and mores of Torah and Halakha and Jewish law. Questions about should we make a bracha, a blessing? How do we prioritize distribution? What do we do when we have uh, scarce resources, triage? Am I allowed to partake in trials? Can I take this vaccine on Shabbat? Some of those questions we're gonna deal with either later tonight or in part number two, which is in two weeks from now. Um, although if you have your vaccine scheduled between now and then, happy to talk about which bracha you might think about making. I wanna start off with the first, with the first source as just an introduction. Uh, we talk a lot about the term and the requirement to protect our lives. That you should guard your lives. And it's, it's a mantra, it's a source for the, one of the requirements to protect our health, do everything we can. We've talked a lot about over the last nine months about how we were davening and why we were davening and why we weren't davening in shul and all the different things. But it, it's important to know where it is situated in the Torah. You might think that it comes along with a plethora of different obligations that revolve our physical body. Right, we wear tefillin, we wear tzitzit, uh, we should make sure that you know, we're dressed appropriately, uh, that we take care of ourselves. But the truth is, is that if you look in source number one, and I brought the larger context in Devarim in the last book of the Torah, we actually see this as part of the spiritual DNA of the Jewish people. That we should cleave to God, those that are cleaving that have held steadfast to God, our life today. And we learned about the responsibility to memorialize, remember, commit to propel ourselves forward based on the Sinai experience, that we should learn and recognize what we saw and we should pass that on to our children. 
Yom Asher Matzalafnei Hashem Al Kacha, the day you stood before God in Chorev at Har Sinai. In the context of that, in the context of the essential underpinning of what it means to be a Jew, of what it means to have that sacred relationship with God, it's in that context that we highlight this obligation of protecting our lives, that we have this notion of making sure that our health is, 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 is protected. And I think it's not just a mitzvah or a bonus that we get to preserve our lives as well, but one of the core responsibilities of what it means to be a Jew, both from the spiritual side the religious side and the physical side is to recognize the responsibility we have of recognizing that our, our, our health, our physical health is, is essential to our ability to perform, to connect, to sanctify everything that we do. We say in the Slichot, that the body is a divine vessel that God gifted us, just like the spirit is a divine body, a divine gift that God gifted us. Um, and it's, it's important to look at it from that, from that perspective. So uh, let, with that introduction, in terms of the role of uh, ensuring our health and safety, let us jump in. I'm gonna do something that I'm sure you all will enjoy. And that is anytime a rabbi tries to give some summation of uh, some of the scientific knowledge, I, I do wanna acknowledge so many of the doctors on this call who have been a resource to me and our community um, in helping us out. So uh, hopefully I will get this part uh, correct as a situate us properly. But please feel free to, uh, I feel like almost 50% of this call are doctors. So please uh, jump in to correct me if, if I'm wrong. Uh, when we talk about vaccines, we really talk about two types of vaccines. There are the therapeutic vaccines, which are attempts of vaccines to address ongoing uh, challenges. Um, this idea of immuno-oncological uh, on vaccines, um, which are really, in layman's terms, vaccines that are trying to attack different cancers that people have. Um, and then more generally, probably vaccines that many of us are, are most familiar with are the preventative prophylactic vaccines. Um, both of these vaccines use essentially the same mechanism to uh, protect the human body. They try to engage the immunosystem um, and try to get stimulate an uh, immune response so that we can recognize the foreign agent in our body so that if we ever do encounter it, our body will be ready to fight it and uh, force it out, right? Uh, Dr. Benjamin, Dr. Luger, I'm getting this right? Good, good, I got, I got a nod. So there are different categories of vaccines. Um, the vaccines really have a storied history going back all the way to the late 1700s with Dr. Jenner, who we're gonna talk about uh, shortly and who is cited heavily in Jewish sources. Um, with the uh, vaccine for smallpox. There are live vaccines, which are essentially teaching the uh, body to learn how to affect by actually infecting the body in some way. Obviously, you know, that is a little bit more risky. We have live attenuated vaccines, which can't replicate in the human body as well. You have inactive vaccines, which are essentially the pathogen or the, the agent that are uh, chemically or heated, altered in a certain way, and therefore it can elicit the immune response, but the risks that might be involved are less. And then you have vaccines that are subunit or, 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 or more based on a toxin, sort of like uh, the tetanus shot. Um, and then you have subunit vaccines, which give us an immune response to not the whole uh, germ, the whole uh, uh, virus, bacteria, or whatever, but just a, just a, a part uh, of it. Um, you know, we particularly for COVID, if you think about the picture that we're all familiar with COVID, so those little red things that stick out of, co out of the COVID molecule that we're all familiar with, with the graphic that's on the news. So, you know, that represents the protein coat, the protein spike that is on the outside. And in order to target the, the, the disease, we're able to target that protein um, and therefore essentially give ourselves a chance of, of, of warding that off. And in some ways that's even better because that is what allows it to connect to the different uh, systems in our body. And we're able to uh, create uh, immune response against that, whether that's by uh, the pure uh, protein or some type of encoding, which uses the messenger RNA or the DNA, which the ones that we're referring to mostly is the Pfizer and Moderna, which use uh, the RNA sequences um, to help us uh, 
to war that off, although I believe the AstraZeneca one uses the DNA. Um, so all of these are different ways that we have vaccines. Um, and essentially, with, through all these categories, the philosophy is the same, right? It's hard to talk about philosophy with vaccines. The philosophy is the same. Let's find a way to provoke our body to learn how to defend against uh, the uh, insertion of uh, this foreign entity into our body. So if God forbid our body does meet that, our body is quickly able to uh, put up a defense against it. Right, that's the most science I'm gonna present tonight. Uh, I'll check with my, uh, my, my, my medical panel and the biologists on the call. I got that mostly right. And he, I feel free to uh, correct me uh, for any of these pieces. Dr. Luger, I got his Ascama, excellent. All right. So what I want to think about together, and this sort of answers uh, Lauren's question about what are the hesitations, uh, I think he actually suggests this as well. The goal for tonight is to look at the halakhic response, not just, and then not to answer direct medical questions, of course. And the goal is not just to, you know, hear the rabbi said you should get the vaccine. But if you don't hear anything else tonight, the answer is you should get the vaccine. Um, but it's to understand how we think about this from a halachic perspective? How do halachic decisors struggle to get this answer, to deal with the sort of questions and factors that come up uh, and try to understand that? The other part of this is also to take a step back and recognize that we are at an incredible um, moment of, of, of history, of halachic history, where we're literally watching in real time Jewish law grapple with new situations unfolding and then trying to understand how we address the world and what we, uh, what, what, what we do uh, in those situations uh, before our very eyes in, in the matter of months, which is unbelievable. So the, what I wanna do tonight, if you look on your handout, uh, is I wanna look at some contemporary responses. Uh, we're gonna start with Asher Weiss, uh, who is a uh, rabbinic halachic decisor from Israel, who is uh, immensely involved in many of the medical ethics uh, components. We'll get back to his bio in a second. Uh, we're gonna talk about him. We're gonna talk about the position of Rabbi Herschel Schefter, Rabbi Mordechai Willig, uh, Rabbi Daniel Fredman, um, and then one or two other individuals as we build out. We're gonna start with the most detail at the beginning because many of the people come to some of the same topics and we'll go from there. So Rev. Usher Weiss uh, is, uh, is, is, is an interesting individual in his own right. He comes from both a Hasidic and a Litvish background and is able to speak in many different uh, ways. Um, he is the posik, the halachic decisor for Shari Tzedek Hospital in Israel um, and is very, very active, a very strong following in Israel from his halachic uh, perspective. Uh, and he has, in recent years, become more and more popular in the American scene um, and uh, really is, reaches a very broad audience. Um, and so he wrote, uh, a tshuva, a responsa. Uh, these aren't response. We often look at tshuva. Ramosha Feinstein wrote, you know, 50 years ago, 70 years ago. This one was written, Parshat Miketz 5781. So we're at uh, Parshat Shemot. So we're, this is written about four weeks ago, five weeks ago. Uh, you know, this is very, this is, this is breaking news. Um, and so he writes this in Hebrew. The original Hebrew is available in the link uh, on the source sheet but I have it translated so it'll be more accessible for us um, to, to look through and sort of see how he addresses this situation uh, for us to think about this. So he writes, Rabbanim community leaders and the wider public are seeking guidance regarding the new COVID-19 vaccine. Is it permissible to receive the vaccination or is it preferable to refrain from doing so? Is a person obligated to be vaccinated in order to protect himself or others? Right, that's essentially his question. That's our question. Uh, and that's what we are attempting to think about. Why would we be concerned? What exactly would we be, uh, what, what exactly would be the issue? So he writes, given that this new vaccine uh, was developed in a very short time frame and its long-term effects have yet to be observed, there are those who are expressing hesitation about its safety. Right, so that is essentially lay laying the groundwork. I will share from many of the people who uh, I've spoken to who, who were some of them involved in this process, uh, Rabbi Dr. Glott, who's been a, a resource for most of the Jewish community during this difficult time, uh, shared as well this next point 
However, many public health authorities in many developed countries have already approved its use. And according to a medical expert, it is safe and absolutely effective, right? He also points out that one of the, while this was done at record pace, Dr. Glott has, has pointed out and it's been documented in other places as well, is what sped this up was not that they cut corners and steps on the scientific part, but the bureaucracy and the concerns about funds and funding and making sure that the right resources were presented were removed from the federal effort to make sure those issues were removed from the federal effort to uh, make sure that this got all the funding it needed and any bureaucratic uh, uh, challenge, you know, split like the Red Sea. Um, but that from the medical side uh, and the testing that no, no corners were cut in making sure that this was done with all the due diligence possible. So he points out that this question about vaccines got first raised 250 years ago when we introduced the smallpox vaccine. The Tiferet Israel, the small, just on your source is a little bit about, uh, uh, about the smallpox vaccine and the individual who found it. The Tiferet Israel notes comments that the pious Dr. Jenner is counted among the Hasidei Ume Ha'olam, one of the righteous of the, of the world, and will rightfully receive his reward in the world to come for saving the lives of tens of thousands of people. This is embedded in his commentary to the Mishnah and Pirkei Avot, right? Anyone, as you, and many of us have studied Pirkei Avot, this isn't exactly one of, the, one of the commentaries that resonate with us in the past, right? The comments, you know, it's often, I imagine, skipped when you're studying Pirkei Avot. But as he notes there in talking about the world to come, uh, he notes people who he thinks uh, merit the world to come, and the, the, uh, the advent of vaccines uh, are definitely worthy of that incredible, uh, incredible note. He doesn't deal directly with the question of vaccines at that time, but later on in his commentary, excuse me, in Yuma, he points out that although vaccinations can have serious side effects, including death, a person nonetheless can be vaccinated as the danger of the disease is far greater, right? So already we begin to see halachic uh, principles developed here that the question is about smallpox. I don't wanna get into exactly the medical side of that. I'm not an expert on that, uh, on any medical issue, but the, the concern is that the, the smallpox vaccine was much more risky for the individuals who were receiving it, particularly the live virus at that time. Um, and there were people who had di even died from the vaccine. Um, and yet, the idea here that the risk, at least what he's describing, that the risk of a single, uh, for an individual, is sort of looked at by uh, looking at the general, the general population. And since most people, this is okay. And the risk, we just take the risk of smallpox and counteract that with the risk of the vaccine. Since the percent of the challenge that one faces for smallpox fall, sm far outweighs the risk when it comes to uh, the vaccine, he counsels people that one should get the vaccine. This is actually a very important piece. You might think, as uh, Lauren, Dr. Uh, Damon, if you're still on, pointed out, it's Pukuach Nefesh, right? Don't we know we take all risks when it comes uh, to someone who is sick? And the truth is that that is the case. Um, but this is a slightly unique case that we see when we talk about vaccines. Normally, when we talk about someone who's sick, we will even do a risky procedure if the outcome might be that they'll be healthy, even though we know there might be some risk and they might uh, not make it, right? If someone is ill and there's a, there's a medical procedure that you know, 75, 80% of the people who undergo it you know, are healed and the other 25% you know, uh, unfortunately don't make it. And right now they are critically ill and they might not make it. So of course we teach according to halakha that we're allowed to take that risk in that moment because the person's already at risk. When it comes to vaccines, the conversation is a little bit different because we're talking about healthy people who are, who are worried about potentially getting sick, but they are not sick right now. It's what we call in halachic terms. They are not all made the fun of. The sakana is not right there that moment. Um, and so that's something that we consider as we talk about this new situation. And that's why the halachic authorities, when it came to the smallpox vaccine, need to take a step back and assess what type of risk, how do we judge this risk? And as we see as Rev Usher Weiss uh, continuing, I sort of, just as you see, just from a format, the handout has the long chuva of Rev Usher Weiss, 
I intersperse it with some Nikorot, some sources that he's referring to, some additional knowledge, um, and then we come back to the English translation. So we see uh, the Tzfer Yisrael, uh, Yisrael uh, Lipschitz, um, his actual commentary and some information about the smallpox vaccine, um, and then we come back in source number five to Rav Asher Weiss. So Rav Asher writes, knows, notes that one of the contemporary rabbin and one of the rabbis of that time, Rav Avraham of Hamburg, who was the rabbi, gives a little biography in, in Hague and then in, later in London, published a sefer called Ale Latrufa. Ale Latrufa, right? What exactly is this book? It's a book written, he actually, you can, you can look it up, it's there today. It's a collection of responsa of chuvot, of requests to rabbis to answer the question, should you get vaccinated? In an attempt to convince the Jewish community to get vaccinated in memory of his two sons who died from smallpox. Right, so this Avram Hamburg writes this chu, this this collection of books, and he cites many chuvot from halakhic authorities of his time that unanimously ruled that people should receive the smallpox vaccine in spite of the fact that several people had died as a result. Right, you balance the risk; the risk is smaller in one carry than the other. He notes that there's a little bit of a debate among that that there were some people who weren't so sure, but even in that moment, they they the the consensus was that someone should uh, take the vaccine, could ultimately could see in paragraph number three, they felt that one should be vaccinated and those who were reticent, maybe they could just shed al tasa and not do something in, in that moment. Continuing on, the Kafachayim, two generations later notes, already in the halachic development, that now that the doctors are wiser, that they administer vaccinations by the means of an in injection into the child's arm. Initially, I think they, they uh, took a, 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 either a smallpox or a cowpox of something and kind of just grafted it onto the blister of, uh, onto the skin of someone. Um, the technology got better. They were able to give what is essentially a precursor to the shots that we have today. Um, and therefore uh, it's much safer. And he notes that therefore it become, it became widely accepted that people took the smallpox vaccine. Clearly continuing on, bottom of page number three, clearly the position of the great halakha decisors of the smallpox error was that a person should undergo vaccination despite the small risk of vaccine associated death. Everyone with me so far? That that, that, that risk, he refers to it in halakhic terminology of a muta demuta, a minor, minor risk that is outweighed by the possible opportunity of, uh, of, 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 of health. Continue, he continues at the bottom of page number three, if this was true at that time, then it's certainly true today when the modern vaccines are considerably safer. And he goes on to describe the process that Pfizer uh, went through. An important Hebrew word, we lose a little bit of the flavor when it's not in Hebrew. So an important Hebrew word we should all learn tonight. How do you say vaccine in Hebrew? Chisun. How do you say placebo in Hebrew? Oh, you're all muted. Um, so he writes, he writes, uh, if you look at the, at the original, he talks about the two cases that, uh, that they, that the two, the, the way that they conducted the experiment. So he notes, um, that, about half of them kiblu et chisun got the vaccine umachsitam and half of them kiblu tachlif akor he got a, uh, a, 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 a alternate an empty alternate essentially which is the placebo right that they got, they got the, they got that, that's, that they went, they underwent this blind study. Um, and as, as you could see, I, I, I copied some of the information from the Pfizer uh, data that backs that up. I um, mean, he describes the process in which, in which they went through. And, and it's just important to note, you know, when, hal when halachic decisor is thinking about this, right, he's really going into the study. He notes what the study found, how there are two deaths in the vaccine group, and there are no links between, found between their death and the vaccine how there were uh, six deaths during the course of the vaccine, uh, sorry, two in the, yeah, two in the vaccine group and four in the placebo. Um, 
I'm sorry, of those who received the placebo, six died during the course of the vaccine, during the course of the study, compared to only two deaths in the vaccine group, and there was no link found between their death and the vaccine. So we see this being included in the halachic response to this situation. Continuing source number seven, which is continuation of Usher Weiss's Chuba. Accordingly to all the medical experts, uh, this vaccine though was, was produced in record time is one of the most effective and safe vaccines ever to be produced. Then he discusses the next halachic axiom when we think about this. How do we integrate the knowledge, the information into the halachic system? Right? We don't just do things necessarily because you know, they seem to make sense to us. If we live our lives based on halachic understanding, we're supposed to, you know, uh, we're supposed to try to figure out really what, what we're supposed to do. And so how do we integrate these type of uh, information into the halachic system? Who's considered an expert? How do we know what they're an expert? What do we do in that situation? How do we take the medical data and use the instructive principles uh, from the medical system to integrate that into the halachic system? So he begins to describe that. One of the axioms of halakha is reliance upon scientific and medical data. I don't want to get into right now, but halakha even gives a status to the uh, scientific world in a, in a certain realm that we call vadai of, uh, of, one second. Um, of vadai, of certainty, of knowing that uh, even though we don't really know, um, but it, it's an example from capital cases. Uh, we'll, maybe we'll talk about this in, in part number two, but there's a certain, even though we know the knowledge is constantly evolving, we can only judge the information we have right now. And therefore halakha uh, looks at some of that knowledge in a more certainty, even though we know it's only uh, you know, provisional information because science is constantly developing, medicine is constantly developing. This is actually a big debate in, uh, in, 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 uh, in, in uh, literature about 200 years ago of how do we look at medical information, um, but, but the general principle is that. So how do we look at that? Halakha guides us uh, as to the, the underlying part. Halakha even guides us as to the protocol when experts disagree with one another, not just Jews disagree, but doctors disagree as well, dictating that we follow the majority or the most expert opinion. Right? Normally, people hear different doctors argue, and what do they say? I'm going to find the doctor that follows the approach that I want. Right? I want a doctor that tells me I can you know, eat lots of fatty meat and not worry about my cholesterol and not exercise. Right? That's not the way it works. That's not the way medicine works, and that's not the way halacha works. Halacha has a, a standard for how we integrate, how we follow doctors who disagree. And this happens all the time, by the way. You don't have to give a corona case, right? Thank God there are many uh, women in our community who recently had uh, children or are nursing. Should a woman fast during uh, Anyom Kippur, right? Some doctors will tell you it's absolutely dangerous for that to happen. Some doctors will tell you under the right circumstances, a woman could fast in that situation. So how do we, what do we do? How do we answer the question? So the answer is Halakha tells us that we should look for two things. Number one, we look for the experts, the people who really know this information, who study, and have done this a long time. And then we take, put a circle around all those experts and we try to assess out what the majority is. Um, you might think, well, I really want to follow the minority opinion. That's not the way halakha works, right? We, you know, we study the principles of Beit Shammai all the time. So that's not the way we ultimately rule in halakhic settings. And so halakha looks at the medical information that way as well. There are slight differences. We'll come to that shortly, a caveat to that, but uh, well, uh, but that's the general. And he notes that there are times where the Gedolim in history have asked questions uh, in the conclusion of the doctors, and he gives some examples, but skipping to the beginning of page number five now, but we definitely see that when it comes to Pekuach Nefesh, when it comes to a possibility of risk of life, when it comes to the doctors, what, what the doctors tell us is what Halacha deems as required. That's why when we shut down the shul, that's what we did. And in the process of reopening, uh, you know, Dr. Luger and, and Dr. Gunnels can attest, you know, the question was, tell us the parameters and we will figure out how to do dobbing around that, not the other way around, right? Whatever they say, go. Um, and that's what Halacha recognizes as a process for, for, for moving forward. Uh, regardless, this, is, this discussion is not, continues on, not relevant to the case at hand, 
because the safety and the efficacy of this COVID-19 vaccine has been attested to by thousands of medical experts uh, and the fact that government, governmental health agencies and authorities have developed it in, in many developing nations have approved it, that there's no basis for concern about serious side effects or vaccine associated deaths. He continues on that he contends uh, that, well, what if we're worried about something in some type of future uh, event? What happens in 50 years from now? You know, we'll find out that there might be, you know, something that was missed or some long consequence. Um, so he, he, he notes very interestingly that there's another component of our decision making. Once we figure out what halacha tells us to do and we act with all the shtadlis, with all the appropriate uh, efforts that we make on our part, and we follow what is the right path to go, we believe as ma'aminim, as people who have faith and trust and bitachon in God, that there's a certain protection that we receive as well. So he, he continues, as I've contended in other cases, that if we fo carefully follow the advice of the experts in their field, even if they have erred, we will be divinely protected. And that this is the concept of Shomer Psaim Hashem, it's actually really interesting as an aside. This is one of those situations where he takes, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the weapon of the enemy and uses it against them. Um, and I say that in quotations. Unfortunately, there is an anti-vax movement that, that finds its roots in the Jewish community as well. And one of the terms that they co-opt for their, for their practices is say, they're just gonna trust in God, Shomer Psaim Hashem, that, one, that God protects the, the simpletons or the fools, that there are certain risks that we are allowed to undertake. How are we allowed to drive our car, right? That's a risk. But since as a society, we've judged that that is a risk that all of humans sort of accept. So we say you're allowed to do certain behaviors that are a little risky, Shomer Psaim Hashem, God watch the simpletons. Now that's not true when there's something that's objectively dangerous, Right, you can't, you know, some people try to claim that at the beginning of Corona, uh, that, you know, people are still going out, this is before mass, show up, sign Hashem, God will protect us. It doesn't work like that. Um, but some people want to claim by vaccines that show up, sign Hashem. So he actually takes that logic, turns it on its head and says, whatever you're concerned about, the small, small chance that maybe there'll be a, a negative effect or impact of this vaccine, you should rely on this approach of Shomer Psaim Hashem, that if we do everything that we're supposed to do and we follow Halakha and the medical experts properly, that that small amount, you can hang your hat on the betachon, on the trust and faith that we have in God. Uh, I, I, I think he means this seriously, but I also think that his phraseology here is not not intentionally ironic, is intentionally ironic uh, because he is uh, well known to be a dissenter uh, against those positions. And then he continues, in this overwhelming case, the majority of, uh, in, in this case, the overwhelming majority of scientific researchers and medical experts all clearly describe that there is uh, neg the negligible risk of serious uh, danger. Um, and then he continues on. And I think this is something that is uh, really important to highlight. We'll, we'll get to the end of his component and then we'll go uh, see the other uh, different opinions that we, we mentioned at the beginning. To our great dismay, uh, and sh to our great despair and shame, excuse me, to our great despair and shame, uh, distress and shame, look at the wrong uh, page here, page number five, excuse me, we're getting ahead of ourselves. Um, we have become indifferent to the plight of others with people saying, I will be fine, I will be healthy, I'm not at risk. At the start of the pandemic, every person truly felt responsible for the other. We mourned together with those families who had lost a loved one to this dreaded new virus and felt their pain. Right? He begins to note that he's watching in society, he's commenting in Israel, but unfortunately it's true everywhere, that what started out as a, as a unity of purpose to keep everyone safe has disintegrated. That people were careful about the social guidance, the, the distancing, wearing masks in order to protect the elderly, the sick, and the vulnerable. But today, as the death toll mounts, and even some of those who have recovered from the virus continue to suffer from its lingering effects, right? There are people we see, we know of people 
who, even though they, they, they are, thank God, no longer sick with Corona, the lingering effect of Corona continues to, uh, you know, affect their body, affect their mental state. Um, continuing to the second last sentence of this, many have become indifferent to the suffering of others. Woe to us who experience that embarrassment and shame. Right. And I think it, it, it's an important note that he's raising here of the need for us to think more broadly. Everything he's been talking so far has really been about our own risk and our own risk uh, analysis. Um, he doesn't bring that so much into uh, the halakhic realm about our responsibility to others. And uh, we'll see others bring that up as well. Um, and it's, it, so therefore, he, he, you can read. I don't want to, uh, you know, we're short on time, so I'm not going to read every part of this right now. He ends up saying, in light of all the above, it's certainly appropriate for each person to be vaccinated. He, he sort of pulls his punch at the end. He doesn't say, he says it's ra'oi, it's appropriate, it's responsible, it's the right thing to do. He does not say it's chayav, that it's obligated. And he notes why. He says, I cannot rule that it's an obligation because he says that people can still wear masks, people can refrain from social distancing, although he thinks that really in the long term that is not a good solution because as more and more people get vaccinated, as more people go out into the world, uh, you know, those, those standards are, gonna, are, are not gonna be as strong. Uh, he definitely doesn't think that then you can go out, you know, if, if you don't wanna get vaccinated, you have to stay in your home, uh, you know, until, you know, the, the pandemic has totally passed. Um, so, you know, I'm not sure how much of a real option that is for many people. You know, one day, God willing, we'll be vaccinated, we'll be able to be back in the show. You wouldn't be allowed to come, according to him. Um, and he, and he notes that, you know, God willing, therefore, it appears to him that, you know, it's halakhic correct to be immunized with the coronavirus vaccine uh, and that we should have a refuah from, from God. So just to, um, to highlight here, in the end, he says it's ra'oi, right? It's very, it's, it's, it's proper. It's the right way that we, we should act. Um, but it's not obligated if one wants to remain on lockdown, wearing a mask with social distancing. Everyone with me so far? So his main point, just to highlight, is the risk here. There's very little risk. Um, and the small, small risk that we might see um, is uh, you know, negated by this Shomer Psalm Hashem idea. Um, but really, that risk is, is, is almost non-existent, uh, according to halachic terminology, uh, because the medical knowledge is so, is, is, is so uh, certain at this point in terms of the, the 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 reality of of the the dangers perceived here um and that the only risk is an unknown risk um and therefore one should should do that what we don't see him do here and we'll see in some of the other ones is really talk about the responsibility vis-a-vis -vis other people not that he disagrees but this is where he is is highlighted any questions on uh rev usher weiss's chuva right now awesome i'm sure it's just because i'm such a clear explainer and uh and that's it. Um, I, I don't know who translated this chuva. Uh, I only saw it yesterday that it come out. Initially, I had the Hebrew on, uh, which would have been a little bit of a different process. Um, I don't know who it is, but, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, we talk about that we bring redemption by quoting in the name of someone. So whoever spent the time and clearly did this, uh, this translation, I am in, in, in their debt. The next position I want to share with you is the position of Mordechai Willard. Uh, you can actually see a picture of him getting vaccin vaccinated. I will just share, uh, you know, as a disclaimer, uh, unfortunately, um, this picture became a little bit of a controversy because the people who, who provided the vaccine uh, did that under false pretenses. They reached out to Rabbi Willig and Rabbi Schefter and said, we have permission to give vaccines to uh, a certain age group, um, and we'd like you to come get vaccinated and take pictures so that we can show everyone that the vaccine is safe and that we can encourage other firm Jews to take the vaccine. Uh, unfortunately, that was not the case. Um, and, uh, you know, unfortunately, that made this photo op a little bit less exciting. But, but, you know, it speaks really to the incredible leadership of Rabbi Willig and Rabbi Schefter, who has helped us so much in the Orthodox community uh, throughout this time, their willingness to jump at the opportunity and get photographed so that they will, uh, so that they could be that example. I'll show you the picture of Rabbi Schefter later, but you'll note he's wearing his hat and his jacket. He got dressed up for the occasion, so he really wanted to, to point people, point, point that out. I did share with him that, um, I did share that the most important part of the picture, though, is not the hat and the jacket, but is the mask, um, and how careful they've been about wearing masks and the example that sets. So that's just my uh, unfortunate political disclaimer. Um, but let's talk about Rabbi Willig. Rabbi Willig agrees with Rav Usher Weiss, 
but he takes it even firmer stance. He believes that this is not a uh, ra'oi, it's not just appropriate, but this is a chiyuv, an obligation for every person to get the vaccine at their right time. And he bases this on the mitzvah of makeh. There's a mitzvah that one should put up a fence around their roof if there is a, uh, if they have a flat roof, lest someone fall off their roof uh, and get injured. And you, know, you could, quote, I brought you here, uh, source number nine, the mitzvah of the Sefer Chinuch, who expands this, who quotes this mitzvah and says, this is really about any situation of potential danger that's in your property, that's in your control. You have the obligation to remove that danger. Uh, if you skip with me to source number 10, where we quote the Rambam, Maimonides, who brings together the laws of protecting, of, of, of prosecuting murder, of rotzeach, of someone who kills, and the laws of protecting life of Shmir Sanefesh, because he sees these as part of the same continuum of making sure it's not just deterring people from committing murder, but the positive side of making sure that we do everything we can to preserve life. So he notes this very clear. There's no difference between a roof or anything else that is dangerous and likely to cause death to a person who might stumble um, in the Hebrew. Uh, and he says that we have to make sure that we very carefully do this. If you skip down a little bit, um, any sort of obstacle that is a danger to life, um, you have an obligation to move it and to protect it. To do excessively cautious to protect and make sure that someone someone is safe. As it says, and if you don't do that, you are over. You violate this prohibition. Of, 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 of this biblical command. And he says, and he notes, the Chola over Alehem, and anyone who disregards them and says, the Omer, and says, Hireni Misaken et Be'atmi, I'm going to you know, risk myself, I'm going to endanger my own life. Umalacher Malai Bekach. And what do, you, what do others have the right to claim that, you're, that you want to do something? It's my life, right? We live in a society and a culture where you know we have individual choice. What I do with my home is none of your business, right? My life, my body, my shul, my simcha, I can do whatever I want, right? I think some of the some of the challenging, most challenging words of this time period is you gotta do what makes you comfortable, right? That's not that's not always the case. You have to do what's right, you have to do what's careful, you have to do what's safe, you have to listen to the experts. The Rabbim writes, in those cases, makin oso makas martyrs. We lash them, we give them lashes to tell them that's not the Jewish way. You can't just make a decision, oh, I'm okay risking myself. I'm okay endangering myself. You're not even allowed to endanger yourself. Not only that, Rabbi Willard points out further that the last halacha of the Shulchan Aruch, of the entire code of Jewish law, is saved exactly for this halacha, to remind us, to highlight the fact that the foundation for everything else that we do in Jewish law is a recognition that we have an obligation to protect ourselves, to make sure that we never take these risks, that I don't have the right to endanger my life. Um, I can't say, oh, I'll take the risk, and what do others have to say about that? One's not allowed to do that. We lash them. And not only that, we are told one who avoids such a person will be blessed. That we should stay away from the people. The bare halacha, uh, composed in the 16, in, 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 at the end of the uh, 17, uh, the end of the 1600s, notes, um, commenting on this halakha, that we have an obligation to remove danger from our lives and not in, risk ourselves, that what's so fundamental about this, that someone who dangers, endangers themselves, ki'ilu, it's as if they despise and they reject, they are corrupt, the divine will. They're not going to see any, any, uh, any benefit from their, from their work. From, you know, someone who says, I'm going to go to shul. I'm going to make sure I'm going to go to shul. I don't care if there's a pandemic. I don't care if I should be quarantined. I don't care what could happen. I want to dive in with a minion, right? That's not, that's not what God wants. You're corrupting God's will. Um, and he concludes that there's no greater heresy than that, right? To be able to say, I'm going to do whatever I want. I'm going to incur whatever risk. That's not the Jewish way. You can't just sign a disclaimer about yourself. Again, Rabbi Willig's notion here is really highlighting about our own personal ob obligation vis-a-vis ourselves. Um, 
let's let's tackle the last two and then we'll uh we'll, we'll, we'll pause for any questions for Schachter in a similar way feels that this is an obligation as well um and he notes that if you look throughout uh anyone doing Dafyomi besides Rabbi Forgash here so if anyone's had the opportunity to learn Gitin or some of the other tractates you'll see that there are entire deposits of medical knowledge in the Talmud really wacky things to do Rav Shachter notes that already in the Gaonim, in the, in the period immediately following the Talmud, they note that those medical treatments should not be followed at all, right? That what we see over here is just the consultation with the medical reality of the time and uh, the treatments that were supposed to be done in those times. My mind, he doesn't bring them up. And really every generation has the obligation to seek out their own medical uh, advice from the medical experts of their time, Jew or non-Jew. Rochester notes, though, in building on that, that what we see from the Gemara's inclusion of that medical knowledge is not that these were prophecies that they were given, that, you know, Halakha Moshe Sinai knew this would work. Not at all. It's the obligation for every generation to codify within the context of Jewish law as well what the medical community around them is saying is best practices. That part of what it means to be observant Jew is to make sure that you live a life of, of, of proper health uh, that you're careful about all of those pieces. Um, and he points out that the inclusion is a really a proof for us at, at, at every point. We have an obligation to listen to our doctors. I, he quotes over here that you have a, someone who fasts on Yom Kippur uh, and you're not sure should they fast or should they not fast. The whole less says that they should fast. Uh, the, the person says they want to fast and the doctor says they shouldn't fast. They shouldn't fast. They're supposed to eat. And vice versa as well. If the doctor says maybe they can make it, and the person says, you know, I'm really not saying, well, I think I need should I should eat. They should eat because we assume that a person has a certain knowledge about their own body that they if they need to eat. But we're not going to take that risk in the opposite way that will let them fast if they think they can do it if the doctor says that they can. All right, everyone with me so far? So Rashanta also feels that there's this there's this obligation, um, and really concretizes this notion that we have to follow the medical advice. That's what halacha re requires us to do. And that's what is the responsible thing to do. All right. I want to jump with you uh, on your handout uh, to source number, uh, to page number 13, uh, to the contemporary response of uh, Rabbi Daniel Fredman. Uh, the one that we just skipped is uh, one from Israel. that actually sees this as you should read the doctors as a edict from Beitin. And he tries to prove that in Jewish sources. We're not getting into that right now. Marie Fredman agrees with everything that was said. I spoke to him today. But he um, takes a different approach as well. And he tries to highlight the fact that there's an, actually an obligation here that is vis-a-vis -vis the other. And that's something we haven't seen uh, so far. We're going we're gonna to talk about that. And then we'll conclude and take any questions. But so far, we've seen R Rav uh, Usher Weiss says it is uh, you know, the right thing to do is ra'oi, uh, and there's so many pieces of times that we do things that are ra'oi, as we take those as obligations. So, you know, ra'oi in halachic literature is something that we often do all the time. So, you know, it's something that he highly, highly recommends. Um, Rav, Rav, Rav Schefter and Rabbi Willig um, both uh, see as well this notion, um, but see this as an obligation both to follow the medical advice of the time um, and this obligation of removing danger from our house and, and taking that taking those pieces. Rabbi Fredman brings a new side. All of that has been vis-a-vis -vis me and my own health. What about other people's health? So Rabbi Fredman points out already, uh, you know, already in Breshit, we have, uh, you know, uh, agadically the notion, we read about Yaakov's encounter with Esav and, and uh, we read Vayira Yaakov me'o Vayetzerov. Yaakov is very afraid and he is distressed. So the Midrash says, is he afraid? Is he distressed? Is it both? What does that mean? The Midrash notes, what happened? Vayira, he was worried that he would have to kill Asaph. That maybe he'll come to a conflict and he'll have to kill Asaph. But worse than that, Vayetzer lo, he was worried, Shalo, that he shouldn't, that he shouldn't be, that he shouldn't kill. Yeah. That he shouldn't have to kill Asa, right? The what's worse, what are we more afraid of? We're more afraid of the fact that he will, um, that he will kill. Uh, where he's more, excuse me, he's more afraid that he will have to kill Asa than if he is killed himself. That there's more of this responsibility 
vis-a-vis -vis the other in this moment. The Tosafists note this in Baba Kama as well, that it's even worse, Yoter, it's not just protecting yourself, but Yoter, Yeshlo Lishmar, Shlo Yazik, that you shouldn't damage, then you shouldn't be damaged. Um, that this, there's this obligation vis-a-vis -vis others as opposed to uh, yourself. And we see this as well uh, in halachic terminology when we talk about the prohibition of lo tamod al damriacha, that you shouldn't stick around idly by by your friend when they are drowning. And really there are two components here uh, that, that, that's important to note. Um, and the question is, at what stage is this, is, does, this, does this obligation come in? Um, we're gonna skip the Talmud in 19, which is the source for this, but we'll see the Beit Yosef comments that one has an obligation because of the laws of low Talmud, not standing idly by when your friend is in danger to enter, to even to, to enter oneself into a position of potential danger when is, uh, one is obligated to do so for the command of low Talmud. Right, what's the example the Talmud gives? You're supposed to, if you see someone drowning, you're supposed to jump into the water. If you see someone being robbed by bandits, you're supposed to be, go and save them. The assumption there, the Beit Yosef notes, is not that all of a sudden, you know, you were in jail with these people and they'll say, hey, buddy, can you leave my buddy alone? No, that there's a certain risk involved in this process. The assumption here is when you're going to jump into the water, if someone is drowning, it doesn't necessarily mean that the water is, you know, a kiddie pool that you can stand up in. Right? The assumption is that there may be some risk involved to you in this process. The Bach, Reveal Circus, notes even further, I'm always excited when I quote the Bach. The Bach is a great, great, great grandfather on my mother's side to my family. I will tell you some family lore for those who are still up with me. The Bach was married to the, uh, the son of the, um, the, the Bach's daughter was married to the, uh, to the, uh, to, uh, the Taz to uh, the to Ray Zahav, um, and uh, she died early, she died young. And uh, afterwards, the Bach chased the Taz out of town. He chased him away, he wouldn't let him marry anyone in town. Um, he, he ran him out of town. And uh, people came to review old circus and they asked him, why are you doing that? Why, why, why is that? And uh, he said, the eulogy he gave at my daughter's funeral was so beautiful, it must have been written for years in advance. So he went and let me scare him away. So that's the family lore. I confirmed that with a historian, with, uh, with uh, Dr. Schneer Lyman uh, at one point. Um, so it's always fun when you get to bring uh, your family into this. On my mother's side, not my father's side. Um, so what, what the Bach notes over here that one is even obligated to save someone and put themselves in a position of, 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 of sakanas nefashos, where they might be in themselves in danger, even if you're not sure that you'll be able to save someone, right? Even if you're not sure. So what we've seen so far is number one, I have an obligation to save someone. Number two, I have an obligation to save someone even if there's a risk to me. And number three, there's an obligation to save someone even if there's a risk to me, even if I'm not sure I'm really gonna be able to save the other person, right? The Radvaz sort of codifies this as well and notes that only if there's a 50-50 chance that I will get hurt in the pro that I will die in the process, do I not have to. But if it's less than a 50-50 chance that I will die while I'm going to save my fellow, I have a biblical obligation to save my fellow. Now, clearly, in our vaccine conversation, the risk for taking a vaccine is far less. Thank God, thank God. It's a maybe not even the chance that God forbid someone will die and the risk is not anywhere near any 50% of anything. And so therefore, according to this lineup, if we believe as science is telling us and the experts are telling us that by getting this vaccine and enough of us get this vaccine, we will be able to protect people even if there's only a chance that we'll be able to protect people. It doesn't have to be absolute. Then we will be able to fulfill the obligation of low time odam reacha or conversely by not getting it we will be contributing to a violation of a biblical command of lo tamo the All right, so that is uh, Rabbi Fredman's argument. Uh, the last I just want to share uh, in the conversation when we think about Jewish responses, uh, Rav Shmuel Kamnetsky, who is one of the leaders in uh, Philadelphia uh, of the uh, yeshivish community, there was unfortunately a fraudulent Hashkaville poster announcement 
that was put up that said that he rules that people should not get the vaccine, that he was shown some secret information and that Jews should avoid the vaccine. And he writes in this letter over here that I've copied over here that he wants to let everyone know that he has not given any advice on the vaccine, that every person should follow Yidrosh, the last slide, Eitzo, Rofa, Shalo, should ask their medical professional, the Yase, Kisi, uh, it's hard to read his handwriting, should do what that medical professional said to do. Um, and and, and, and that's, what, that's what they should do, and everyone should have a full Shlema, so that everyone should understand that, that he's not against it. So what we've seen so far, uh, and with this, we'll close up and take any questions, uh, is a number of different approaches. We saw really a range either from it's permissible, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's advised, it's the right thing to do, but it's, I can't say it's an obligation. That was Rav Asher Weiss, uh, but that's only if you're going to follow uh, dogmatically all the laws of, uh, all the rules of social distancing and masking and everything else. We saw Rav Schefter and Marie Willig see that it's a chiyuv, an obligation that stems from my obligation to myself to keep myself healthy and to remove sakana, to remove the chance of danger in my life and to follow medical approach of, of society. Um, and then we saw the last opinion of Rabbi Daniel Fridman, uh, who's a rabbi in Tinek, who notes that really there's an obligation that stems vis-a-vis -vis everyone else, the biblical obligation of lo tamod, adam reacha. One should not stand idly by, by their fellow. And that this situation clearly falls in to the parameters of that halacha and therefore one is obligated. Along the way, we also saw how Jewish law looks at uh, medical professionals as uh, experts uh, and really integrates that data into our halachic perspective, that there's an obligation to follow the medical consensus of recognized medical doctors. In a previous year, which is linked to at the end of this, end of this handout with uh, additional reading, we talked about how Jewish law even looks at the association, you know, when someone is uh, licensed by a governmental, a governmental agency, that that's an important uh, halachic indicator as well. We saw that with the Novi Huda with regular vaccines. Um, and so we pointed that out. I give to you on the last page of this handout, which I hope you will explore on your own, the RCA OU COVID-19 vaccine guidance, which they released. Uh, a, a, a link to the handout on Jewish approach to general vaccines a class I gave two years ago, a letter I submitted to the Connecticut state legislator about vaccines that uh, our local uh, state representative asked me to put together, and then nine additional uh, bullet points of further areas to read about a number of these different topics, about vaccines, about the notion of Shomer Psaim Hashem, that God watches over the simpletons, about dangers and liability in halacha vis-a-vis -vis vaccine, um, and, and all different other pieces from that perspective. So I appreciate you joining me. Uh, next week, we will, uh, not next week, in two weeks, we will uh, look at, does one make a bracha? How do we distribute the vaccine? What does Jewish law think about that? Um, is one allowed to sign up for these things? Uh, and all the different uh, more uh, in the weeds conversations uh, as well. Any questions? I open this questions. I look forward to, uh, to talk uh, and discussion. Yeah, Rabbi Brander, I didn't see any of those specifically. It seems as though if somebody doesn't get vaccinated and they spread COVID to somebody else and that person dies, the person, should, the person who did that has responsibility for killing somebody. In the old days, I guess they would go to an ear miklat. We don't have those anymore. But it doesn't seem to address the responsibility to protect other people is not really rescuing somebody who's who's in danger it's endangering somebody who wouldn't have be in that danger unless you refuse vaccination meaning meaning well i think you're asking two questions how do we relate to people who don't there are other two votes that we talk about and there's actually something i think i raised with one or two people a question that got asked can i dive in for someone who doesn't follow the guidance and they get sick. Can I dominate for them? And that was actually a halakhic conversation. Um, but uh, I think the, the point here is, is that we're looking at these people, at least according to Rabbi Fredman's approach here, 
we're looking at this as a as, as the world is writ large is you know drowning in COVID nineteen, um, and by getting a vaccine, you're able to begin to uh, throw a life a life raft to that. Um, and the more the more life uh, what are those things called those circular life things lifesavers the more lifesavers that we throw into the water, eventually the water will be filled with that and uh, no one will be drowning. Um, I think that's sort of what his, what his thought process is here. Um, so he, he definitely sees that as, you know, response to immediate danger. Uh, I think Rev. Usher Weiss alludes to that in his chuva as well, when he talks about that the whole world, we're seeing people dying every day, um, as well as that immediacy that we see that, uh, see it very connected one to one. Sid, any questions? I see your no no hands. Uh, Neil, thanks for joining us. What was what was the answer to the that question? Can you dive in for?